Friends, we've had a good Congress. We've had some great debates. We've refreshed our resolve. We've said a well-deserved thank you to Anami, our own dear Anami Nates, whose selfless efforts for our party have served us so well for so long. Thank you, Anami. We've enjoyed the wonderful Sicilian warmth of our friends from Italia dei Valori. I'm honored, friends, that you have chosen me to lead our great party. Despite my title, I come from humble origins, but I pledge you I will give this job every noble effort for as long as you entrust me with the privilege of it. If I succeed in taking our party forward, it will be because I stand on the shoulders of the great leaders of our past. People like Simone Weil and Willie de Klerk. And I'd like to pay a very special tribute to Willie, our party's longest serving leader and indeed our president of honor, who passed away barely a month ago. Willie was, as Deputy Prime Minister of his country, as Chairman of two of the European Parliament's committees, as an EU Commissioner, a man who nurtured and inspired others more than he sought glory for himself. Willie de Klerk, we salute you. Now, I'm not sure what you expect of me, but let me say something of how I plan to proceed. Leading a party at a European level is less like commanding an army and more like conducting an orchestra. Very little of the music we play is new. The scores have been written by liberal philosophers down the ages. But the conductor must find new expressions of time-honored tunes, reinterpret their themes for today. And I am so fortunate that you have given me some virtuoso players. Mark Guerrero, Alexander Lambsdorff, Leo Luca Orlando, Vesna Puzic, Dick Roach, Astrid Torsch, Luzavis van der Laan, all vice presidents for a reason. Fellow Liberals, the task ahead of us is huge. If you read The Wealth of Nations, but failed to read Adam Smith's other works, you might believe that markets regulate themselves. But those Liberals who saw the danger signals before the crash, people like Otto Graf Lambsdorff and Vince Cable, know the importance of market supervision. Our liberal input now to creating those necessary controls through Commission Vice President Olly Rehn, through Parliamentary <coughs> Committee Chair Sharon Bowles, through National Finance Ministers like Didier Reinders, has been crucial. Liberals believe in market enterprise, but we know the need for government too. Let nobody say, let nobody say that liberalism is some kind of casino capitalism. Let none, let none say either that liberalism comes to our continent from overseas. True, liberal ideas flourished in fertile soil in Britain and later in America. But those ideas took root right across mainland Europe too from the legal and political bedrock of Greco-Roman civilization, from the morality of the Abrahamic religions and secular humanism, from Renaissance culture through the Enlightenment unto the present day. Ideas of tolerance, freedom of conscience and expression, freedom of scientific research. They were dashed between the scylla of nationalism 
and the Charybdis of Jacobin socialism. And the two great wars of the last century nearly left them for dead. But liberal ideas rebounded, intellectually stronger from every defeat. And today's rejection of liberalism in some countries in the name of political correctness makes a major mistake. It ascribes to liberalism the injustice perpetrated by the political power which liberal policies produced. <coughs> Today's emerging countries in Asia or elsewhere will also emerge because of liberal ideas. In time, too, they will dominate. Their domination will lead to injustice. But that injustice is not innate to liberal ideas. Political constructivism is the worst legacy of the Enlightenment. The road to hell is paved with good intentions. And so, yes, I repeat after Adam Smith, private vices can be public virtues because through interaction and exchange, the collective interest is served. So, efficient capital markets, openness to new ideas, the rule of law, these three essentials are the building blocks for liberal success. So we must regulate financial markets, but not strangle them as some social democrats would. We must welcome new ideas, but not resist progress in science, as the Greens often do. We must insist on the rule of law, not turn a blind eye to legality like the European People's Party. The European, the European People's Party. Black as the soul of old, old Europe. Cynically supporting the likes of Berlusconi, Pajesco, Boyko Borisov, the cowboys of democracy. You know, you know, the, you know the, president, the president of the European Socialists resigned this week out of failure after Spain's election result. The president of the EPP should step down out of shame. <laughs> our, union, our union condemns judicial abuse in Azerbaijan. But when Romania's president tells the courts to cut compensation payments to save the state money, the EPP, of which he is a member, says nothing. We condemn insidious legal change in Russia. But when Berlusconi made false accounting no longer a criminal offence, the EPP stayed silent. The EU calls for fair elections in Belarus. <coughs> but when Hungary's government changes the constitution to need a two-thirds majority to oust Viktor Orban, Europe's largest party not only cheered, in the European Parliament they gave him a standing ovation. I remind them of the words of their own Conrad Adenauer. God placed limits on man's reason, but not on his stupidity. <laughs> when, a society, when a society begins to go wrong, Invariably, it begins to go wrong at the top. Friends, we must rebuild from the base. We now live in a global community. The ideas of global governance in liberal internationalism are essential. Indeed, the challenges to human dignity and welfare are so great, only liberal internationalism holds the answers. Which challenges do I mean? The challenge of development for five billion fellow human beings of using the might of the market to raise living standards and so lower birth rates, of knowing that if deprived of dignity at home, people will venture abroad, of recognizing in the remittance of income from overseas workers the most powerful form of development aid. 
or the pressing challenge of energy security when fossil fuels cause climate change. Look around you. An Indian summer in northern Europe in November. A monsoon here in Messina. Unusual, perhaps, but both consistent with climate change science. Or the challenge of fighting international crime when some criminal gangs are now more powerful than some national governments, of policing Colombia or Afghanistan or Myanmar, where the narcotics trade for the markets of the rich world spawns the smuggling of arms and the vile trafficking of people, of combat combating, counterfeiting and piracy, of goods and ideas. These are the challenges, population, climate, internationally organized crime, and they are supranational challenges needing supranational responses. And if liberals support European integration, despite its challenges and inconvenience, mm -hmm. it's because it's the most effective lever we have for regaining control over our lives. If, <laughs> if, you'd ask, if you'd ask any of our heads of state and government, even ten years ago, why their country was in the EU. They'd have given you one of two answers. Either they'd have said the EU had given them the longest period of peace in their history, or that the explosion of trade through the single market brought unparalleled prosperity. But I wager, if you ask any of today's national leaders why they're in the EU, they'd give you a different answer. They'd talk about the difficult decisions deriving from challenges with which their country alone cannot cope. If they are liberals, they might add that cultural exchange is the best weapon of mass construction. Yet, EU integration is increasingly under threat. In a difficult and dangerous world, the right reverts to nationalism or the old religious rituals. The socialist search in vain for ideological maps for the new landscape we are crossing. And the Greens go no global. But we cannot pull the blankets over our heads and wish the world would go away. It does not work, because no continent is an island. Indeed, where others see only problems, we see opportunities. Where other parties build walls, against the winds of change, liberals build windmills. And listen, just listen. Something, something is moving out there. Something that is like the twilight sound of the crickets, immense, filling the woods at the foot of the slope. That's why liberals are at the forefront of efforts in global dialogue and international change. It's why we established the International Criminal Court to prosecute crimes against humanity. It's why we see renewable energy not only as part of energy policy, but as central to our security, reducing dangerous dependence on fossil fuels and cutting carbon to avoid catastrophe. And it is why, when others lose their faith in Europe, we liberals want a leap of faith in our common capacity and common concern to keep the great tribes of Europe together. If our party is going to achieve all that, we need some reforms. Three in particular. First, we must get smarter. You know when the film Jurassic Park came out? Our Swedish liberal friends produced a poster depicting the dinosaurs of Sweden, or Social Democratic Park, as they called it, with the subtitle, Folk Partit, Small Enough to Survive. It was a great poster. It was a great poster, and it worked. Sweden is no longer the playground of the Social Democratic dinosaurs. But our party cannot prosper by staying small. We must grow by being smarter than our opponents. Remember Charles Darwin, 
It's not the strongest of the species which survive, he wrote, nor necessarily the most intelligent. It is those most adaptable to change. Friends, we must be the first to change. We must promote the power of politics by being agents for reform. Re-engage the people with our party. We need better to distill our message and better to communicate it, and it will be the first task for our new bureau. And as we become smarter agents for change, we must seize the supranational stage. In 1976, we were the first to have a pan-European manifesto for the first European Parliament elections. In 2003 and 2007, we set up quickly an independent HQ and then a European political foundation. And yet, in the jigsaw of European construction, supranational elections are the missing piece. So now we must press for election of MEPs from supranational lists, rather than 27, 27 national ballots on the same day for the same party. We have a truly European election. It could be the election of all MEPs from those lists. It could be just a symbolic number. But people must know their vote has a Europe-wide impact. So let us link it, too, to the choice of the next president of the European Commission. Let these be a focus of our work, to become smarter and more supranational. Now, my third reform may be the most challenging. Because, as Mark Twain wrote... We can change the world or ourselves, but the latter is more difficult. We need to be less averse to risk. We must open our doors to embrace new members, and some of them may not be liberals, or at least in the pure sense of the term, or they may not be able to call themselves liberal in countries where the word has been vilified. They may be campaigners against corruption, like our friends here in Italy, in Italia dei Valori, or in Vesci Varegna, in the Czech Republic. They may be radicals, as in the Transnational Radical Party, or in Palikot, in Poland. Or they may style themselves Democrats or Republicans, like our friends in France. They are all allied to our great liberal tradition, and we must ally with them on the matters, the issues which matter most. Now, already, already we sit with some of them on the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, in the European uh, Committee of the Regions, in the European Parliament. And I tell you, it is sometimes hard talking to our members or studying their voting records to tell who is a so-called liberal and who is not. Because, at European level at least, we think the same thoughts. Those three reforms, to be smarter, to be bigger, to unleash the liberal genius for the supranational, are my priorities for this party. I will not achieve them without your support, but our party will not prosper without your help in achieving them. I will strain every sinew to leave to my successor a stronger party than the one you've elected me to serve. I have no illusions about the scale of the challenge. If candor is sometimes an obligation of friendship, then I say to you, dear liberal friends, we are not in great shape. In seven of the countries of the European Union, as Annemie said, we have no member party. In nine countries, we are divided between two or more parties. Where five years ago we had eight Liberal Prime Ministers around the Council table, we now have only two, and just 10% of the MEPs. In many countries where we govern, the opinion polls look bad, and often where we don't, they hardly look good. Some of our parties, spooked by the opinion polls, pander to populist pressure. Why? Why? We live in an age replete with opportunities for liberalism. Recession may be harder to handle than growth, but it offers opportunities. The torrents of liberal ideas 
that cascade down the hillsides of history, from Milton, Erasmus, and Kant, from Pierre Bayle and Benjamin Constant, from Smith and Stuart Mill, from Humboldt and Mises and Popper, from Cavour, Einaudi, Gobetti, Grundtvig, Sverdrup, Norberg, Rawls, Keynes, Darendorf, Gasset, and Galbraith. These ideas offer recipes for hard times as well as good. So, fellow liberals, I cannot offer you an easy time. The going will be tough. But pluck up courage, stiffen your sinews, be prepared to live a little dangerously. Because if you do not, the greater danger is that we will not live at all. Most of all, have confidence in our creed. To be a liberal and to know it is enough.